Okay, uh, kind of the last thing we're going to talk about in this unit is the Kingdom of Kush. Um, so the Kingdom of Kush um, was directly south of Egypt along the Nile. The Nile continues further south than, than the border of Egypt. Um, and it was known in the ancient world by many different names. So Tasseti, T-A-S-E-T-I, which means land, land of the bow, like bow and arrow, because they were um, expert archers. Ta Nehisi, uh, T-A-N-E-H-E-S-I, which is land of copper. It's very rich in copper. Nubia, uh, which is derived from the Egyptian word for gold, because there was gold there, many resources again. And then Kush. Um, which the origin of that name has uh, different ideas about about the name. Um, some religious scholars link it to Cush, but spelled with a C, who was the son of Ham, who was the grandson of Noah. So um, there are ideas that this links back to to the Noah of the Bible, uh, according to religious scholars. So basically, this is the land to the south of Egypt, and it was um, as large of a power as Egypt in the ancient world. This kingdom dominated what is now Sudan between 2500 BC and 300 AD. It was a very powerful kingdom, and I include it here because its history is very interwoven with Egypt. They're very interconnected. So to me, it makes sense to talk about them along with Egypt. Uh, by the way, knowing where this is, which just south of Egypt works, um, is, is something you might want to keep in mind for your quiz. Okay, so this area and its history were largely ignored by Western scholars and archaeologists until the mid-20th century. Um, small little shout out to a Swiss archaeologist, uh, Charles Bonnet. He really pushed the research in this area. He is now, um, at the time of this recording in 2022, he is uh, 88 years old. And he's been going to Kerma, which is in Kush, uh, in Su what is now Sudan, f every year since 1970 to do research and fight for its acceptance into the canon of Western scholarship, uh, particularly as it relates to Egypt, which is kind of a big thing. So why have you likely never heard of the Kingdom of Kush, but you've probably heard of Egypt? Egypt kind of gets lumped in with Europe in terms of Western history, um, which is something I, I noticed and thought was a little bit strange when I took art history as an undergrad. And I this is a class that focuses on Western art history, but uh, Egypt is considered part of that history, so I like to expand it a little bit um, to talk about the Kingdom of Kush. Uh, the history of art in, in the Western world is very racist. That's just a thing that we can say out loud now. Um, it's getting better, but it's still an issue. And so this weird kind of whitewashing of Egypt that has happened, like throwing them in with, with Greek history and things, is, is very strange. Um, okay, all of that aside, let's talk about the Kingdom of Kush. So Kerma, uh, which was the capital for a long time, is also called Dukai Gel and is located in present-day northern Sudan. Uh, Kerma pre-Kingdom of Kush was um, kind of a power in and of itself. Um, the center city of this, of this place was made of mud brick, um, which were, were very uh, highly stacked. Um, and so this becomes kind of a defining uh, symbol of this area at first. Okay, so the first major discovery about the Kingdom of Kush, archaeologically, is at Kerma. Um, and it dates to as early as uh, 3000 BC and was the first capital of the powerful indigenous kingdom that expanded to encompass the land in southern Egypt and contemporary Sudan. The kingdom rivaled and at times overtook Egypt. So there's this long history of interaction between Kush and Egypt. So let's look at some things. All right. Oh, that's the slide I should have had up when I was explaining where this is. So Egypt is up there. <laughs> okay. And uh, now we're in uh, Sudan. You can see it's highlighted here on the map of Africa, uh, which is directly south of Egypt, which is 
uh, the, the original Kushite kingdom. So they uh, are, as you can see, the main areas are kind of all built around the Nile as well. So the Nile is also very important in their history. Um, the first Kushite kingdom had a rich relationship with a lot of ancient um, entities, especially Egypt, um, that was based largely in trade. They traded gold, they traded ivory, they traded bronze, they traded incense, they traded ceramic goods. Um, they traded all of these things with Egypt and with Punt. Uh, Punt was a, a kingdom uh, near the Red Sea in the east. Um, so Nubia, or Kush, is first discussed in Egypt's records in 2300 in relation to trade. So we know they had a long standing um, trade relationship. Okay, one of the things that Kush becomes famous for is its blue glazed pottery. You can see an example of this in the middle. Um, and also these red brown tulip shaped ceramics, which uh, you can see to the left. The way that they achieve this blue glaze that's on both the middle image vessel and also the jewelry on the right is a technique called faience, F-A-I-E-N-C-E. -E. It's used in Kush and in Egypt, and it's basically introducing metal to the glazing firing of ceramics. So particularly if you add tin and copper to the firing, you can get this kind of blue glazed effect. Um, the other thing, they're also known as the land of the bow, they had really uh, expert groups of archers. They made these very large arrowheads um, out of flint, and um, so there's lots and lots of arrowheads that have been discovered, and they were kind of, uh, had a really intense defense system in terms of their very good uh, archers. Here's just some other examples of uh, work that um, smaller artworks and artifacts that have come out of the Kingdom of Kush. They also made these jars out of alabaster that were very popular in Egypt. Alabaster is a stone that's found in, in the area. They did gold inlay, they did lots of silver decoration, they made these kind of complicated um, beaded necklaces uh, that were also used to decorate um, animals as well as worn as jewelry by people. Um, they created these silver uh, silver gilded mirrors. This is a hand mirror. We have these uh, necklaces, lots and lots of um, very kind of high-end objects being traded out of Kush. Around 1500 BC, um, Egypt's Pharaoh, uh, Mentuhotep II, he's the guy from the Middle Kingdom that united everything. He decides while he's uniting Egypt, he wants to also conquer Kush. So he marches south along the Nile and is able to conquer Kerma, which is not something that Egypt had been able to do previously. While there, he establishes temples and forts and brings a lot of the Egyptian culture and religion uh, into Kush. Egyptians believed that the source of all creation was actually in the kingdom of Kush, specifically on a flat mountain top by an S-shaped bend in the Nile. So this was something that was very important to them. They build a holy temple at this site, which was called Jebel Barkal. Um, I, my slides are out of order. I think I have an image of it. There we go. Jebel Barkal. So, sorry, that slide's supposed to be much earlier. This is the temple to Amon, uh, who was, remember, the creator god, also the sun god. He's kind of conflated with Ra. They're kind of the same guy. And so this is the tiny remnants of this temple that was built here that's thought to be the creation site. And then here's a reconstruction of it. Um, so the temple to Amon Ra is mentioned by many pharaohs, including Ramses II, who sends uh, resources to maintain it during his reign as well. So later in the New Kingdom, this temple is still maintained by the pharaohs because it was considered so important. Let me go backwards. I don't know why I have that uh, out of order. Sorry about that. Okay, uh, Egyptian rule prevails in Kush until the 11th century BC, when Egypt begins to kind of weaken, this new dynasty of uh, Kushite kings rises up in the city of Napata. Napata was actually um, founded by Tutmos 
the third, so that's Hatshepsut's uh, nephew who tried to sort of erase her from history. So he goes down um, into the kingdom of Kush and create, kind of founds this new city called Napata. He's not able to hold on to it. The Kushites retake it over and make it their new capital. And this new capital kind of asserts itself as the rightful inheritor and protector of the ancient Egyptian religion. So remember later when um, Akhenaten comes into power in the Amarna period up in Egypt, he changes everything and says, we now have one god, his name is Aten, he is the sun creator god, and this is who everyone must worship, no more other gods. So the Kushites kind of uh, have merged the Egyptian religion with the previously existing indigenous religion in the area, and they kind of consider themselves the protectors and maintainers of the Egyptian religion. Okay, so um, a lot of things happen. We have a lot of temples built even after Egyptian occupation, like the Temple of Soleb, which is in modern day uh, Sudan. So we can see um, the way that it is structured is actually quite simple, similar to the Temple of Luxor, which was, uh, which is on the east bank of the Nile in Egypt. So look at these pictures of Luxor. You can kind of get, we get the slanted sides. We have all the commons, the columns, the hypostyle hall. We've got the new kingdom style of sculptures. And then look at the layout of these two. So we have the Luxor temple plan and the temple of Soleb plan. So you can see that not only is the religious and cultural aspect of um, Egypt kind of integrated into Kush, but some of the um, architectural designs and layouts, like a hypostyle hall, like these slanting exterior walls, are also incorporated. Here at the ruins of the Temple of Soleb, you can see that there are hieroglyphics on the columns um, inside this temple. You can see Ankh up at the top, symbol of life. Um, so we have uh, Pai, who is Napata's third king, and um, he marches north, okay? And uh, he decides that not only uh, is Kush going to be independent, the kingdom of Kush, because they're now independent from Egypt, he decides that he is going to march north and he is also going to take over Egypt. Um, so he is the first Kushite king who unites um, Kush and then he goes on uh, to kind of invade Egypt. Uh, Kashta's daughter, which is his granddaughter, Amun Nidris I, becomes the god's wife of Amun in Thebes. So a god's wife is kind of like a high priestess and is a very high up figure in the government, basically. And so he kind of has infiltrated some of, of the ruling um, class in Egypt. Okay, so this is Amenhotep III. Uh, and we can see the red granite lion statues. So this is in Nubia, this is uh, in Soleb, and we see the direct influence. We also see, this is a sphinx of Taharko, um, who is one of the kings of the Kushites, and he is portrayed as, as in this sphinx form, right? So we can see some pretty direct uh, reference to Egyptian culture. Okay, so. Pai has marched north, he conquers Egypt in 730 BC. He then expands the Kushite territory to include the entire Nile Valley. Pai, who is also called Pianki um, in Sudan, starts a new dynasty of Egyptian pharaohs. Historically, this group of pharaohs are called the Black Pharaohs, um, and they are Egypt's 25th dynasty. They rule for three quarters of a century until the Assyrians kind of come in and capture all of Egypt. But they rule for a pretty long time. After their defeat, the Kushites return to Napata in uh, 591 BC. Uh, Samtek II, Egypt's new pharaoh, attacks Napata, and then the Kushites designate Meroe as their new capital. Okay, so the 25th dynasty ends in 656 BC. All right, we looked at that already. So now we're in Meroe. So they just keep moving further south as uh, as they encounter conflict. So they go from existing as the kingdom of Kush, as Nubia, 
then they're ruled by the Egyptians, then they get independence from the Egyptians, then they take over all of Egypt and rule that for almost an entire century, then Egypt is conquered by the Assyrians, then Egypt comes back, then Egypt goes uh, and conquers them back down to Napata, so they retreat further south to Meroe and become, uh, Meroe becomes their uh, new capital. Okay. Uh, Aspelta is the leader that initiates this move and, and is the leader when they're first at Meroe. Um, this is a good capital because it's very strategically located. It's where the inland African trade routes meet the caravan trails from the Red Sea. It's a very fertile land. It's kind of an oasis in the desert. It was also isolated enough to allow the Kushites to remain independent. Um, the distinct Kushite uh, kind of um, right culture and script are referred to as Meroetic. So, so instead of Kushite, Meroetic refers to the language uh, of this culture. Some scholars refer to um, 590 BC, post 590 BC Kush as the Meroetic uh, kingdom rather than the Kushite kingdom. Okay, so what do we see when we get to Meroe? What are these? Pyramids. I thought only Egypt had pyramids. You would be wrong. <laughs> so here we have other pyramids. These are smaller than the, the Great Pyramids in Egypt. They're also steeper. The sides are steeper, right? Um, so we see uh, they are kind of out in this desert. Let's see. Here's a closer up example of them. These are individual tombs set up as small pyramids and look at the slanting walls at the beginning. They're still quite large. They're not tiny. Uh, they have large-scale um, inset carvings, relief carvings in them. They also have hieroglyphics on them or did originally. You'll notice the tops of a lot of them are destroyed. That is because of this guy whose name is Giuseppe Ferlini and in 1836 he comes from um, Italy. He fancies himself an explorer. And he thinks that because there was gold inside the pyramids, the tops of the pyramids at Giza, he thinks maybe these pyramids have secret golden tops underneath the stone or something. So he breaks the tops off all of these pyramids looking for gold. He does not find any because he is uh, an idiot. Okay, so, um, Meroe. All right, here's another view. Uh, when Cleopatra, which we don't talk about because she's not actually particularly significant in terms of Egyptian history. When Cleopatra dies in 30 CE, Rome takes control of Egypt. Rome kind of takes control of everything after a while. We'll learn about Rome more when we get to our Roman Empire section. This action um, strains the truce between Kush and Rome. They had a truce and they liked to trade with each other. Eventually Rome invades the kingdom of Kush under the leadership of Queen Amenorinas the uh, Kushite or Meroite forces attacked the Roman forces. Eventually, the queen is able to negotiate a peace treaty with the Roman Empire that favored Meroite interests over Rome. Then they enjoy relative peace. No one really messes with them because when you stand up to Rome to the point that Rome decides to make a treaty with you instead of conquering you, uh, you're pretty untouchable. Those were kind of the biggest force uh, in the in the ancient world at this time. So it's kind of a big deal. So Meroe enjoys relative peace and stability after this until um, it's abandoned in the fourth century. Okay. Here we have a bunch of rams. Remember the ram kind of becomes another symbol of Amun-Re. So this is one of the Amun temples at Naga near the Meroe pyramids, south of the ancient city of Meroe. And this was just sort of abandoned and the desert kind of takes over a lot of it. This all would have been brightly painted. We'll look at some more examples of things in Meroe. This is uh, a Hathor chapel. So Hathor, remember, is the um, mother goddess who's portrayed as a cow often. Notice the tops of these columns. They kind of look like Corinthian columns, which don't come about for many, many, many years later. And we'll talk about that when we get into the uh, high classical or late classical and Hellenistic period of Greece. This is the largest pyramid. Um, so they did have larger pyramids as well. This one was at Al Kuru, uh, built in 
built in 325 BC. It was once 115 feet high. It was disassembled in the Middle Ages, um, and the stone was repurposed for other building materials. So it's largely destroyed, and there's not a huge record of it. But I just want you to know there were also larger pyramids um, in Kush, not just the smaller ones. Okay, so what happened to Kush? What happened to the kingdom of Kush? Well, the kingdom of Aksum to the southeast happened. Uh, King Azanus invades Moroe around 330 uh, CE. It's pretty devastated. It's, it's pretty crushed. Uh, Meroe clings on for another 20 years, but it struggles and then it collapses. The Kushite culture is gradually replaced by the Nobute, uh, the Mo Nobatie, the Makurie, and the Alodie are three smaller kingdoms that take over the region after Kush. And that's kind of the history of the Kingdom of Kush and how it is very integrated with Egypt. All right, next we'll talk about the prehistoric Aegean.